Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Alex Van Hanel, who will be talking to us today about false positives, spectres of sex positivity in a sex game gone wrong. So please do um, leave questions in the chat. Um, there's also the Q&A, which you can pop questions into if you'd rather do it anonymously. Uh, and so Alex will be talking about 30 to 40 minutes, yeah, roughly. Like that. And then we'll we'll have time for questions and discussions after that. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs> Is the camera here, Emma? It's in the, in the app. So the camera's in the app. Okay, right. Just so I look in the right place. Okay, thank you so much, Emma, for inviting me to um, talk about this uh, work that I've been doing for a couple of years around the spectre of um, how sex games gone wrong or so-called sex games gone wrong are figured within uh, the context of the criminal court. So um, uh, what I want to talk about today is some elements of the research that I've been looking at in terms of how um, the, um, the, the spectre of sex positivity emerges in some of the cases in which a consent defence is, is attempted to be mobilised in the context of a sexual encounter which has in some way gone wrong for um, the woman in, the, in these cases. So I'm going to um, talk about some issues which I, which I think are going to be interesting. I'm interested to hear your feedback about that. But also I'm going to outline three cases in which women have died as a result of a so-called sex game that has gone wrong, a sexual encounter. Um, and um, so that those parts of the presentation do detail a bit about the, um, the, the, uh, the events that took place and um, some of the evidence that is mobilized as part of those, um, as part of the defense, um, uh, but on behalf of the defense um, in order to uh, try to account for the um, events that have gone wrong. So in order to do that and see what we're doing here. Yes, there we are. So my starting point really for this is a response to, or like a, um, a yeah, a response to um, the uh, work of Amy uh, Wooder and uh, Vanessa Panfield, who in 2021 um, wrote a book called um, Calling for a More Sex Positive Criminology. And so here um, they make the case for inter, inter, integrating intersectional sex positive queer feminist praxis into socio-legal uh, approaches um, from in, within the context of criminology, deviance, and uh, legal studies more broadly. So this is a call, um, which even though uh, um, is one which has been developed from through their voices more recently, is one that has been going on in terms of socio-cultural um, sex uh, studies for decades. And the work of Gail Rubin and Patrick Califia have been really seminal in terms of uh, that work. So um, the uh, call for sex positivity is one that uh, is characterized by a recognition that sex is um, neither bad nor good, sex is not a taboo, sex is consensual, uh, sex is agentic, sex is not harmful, that desire and pleasure within a sexual encounter are intrinsically enough to justify that encounter. There is an acceptance of difference and an awareness of risk. So these ideas around um, what what fosters sex positivity, like uh, turn around these sorts of concepts around um, sex as being an intrinsic part of establishing sexual citizenship. Sex positivity is often contrasted with sex negativity. So that, mean, that uh, means seeing sex as negative, seeing sex as taboo or moralistic. Sex negativity prefers, prefers monogamous, heteronormative, procreational sexual uh, practice, the sorts of practices that you might find in the center of Gail Rubin's uh, charmed uh, circle of um, uh, sexual practices, the charmed middle, the sexual practices which are, which are um, socio-culturally endorsed or encouraged. Um, and sex negativity is therefore associated with prejudice around which body should be having sex, with whom, how, in what way, and so on. So sex positivity, uh, this, uh, this is my suggested, my suggested list, some of the suggested ideas I think are, are relevant to understand sex positivity, but it can be criticized on the premise that because of the, the latent assumptions um, that, uh, that uh, suggest that sex is, sex is not only normal, but, but is uh, intrinsically important, um, it, it is possible to, uh, I would argue that through a, perhaps a willful misreading of uh, the way in which sex positivity is constructed, that sex is then is understood in a sex positive lens as compulsory, um, that everybody should be having it, uh, that everybody should be having it in as creative ways as possible, that prudishness is undesirable, that anything goes, and that basically um, there is an apolitical, uh, a, crit a critique of apolitical, uh, apoliticality, 
politicalness uh, to um, some discourses around sex positivity. And I think these are really valid critiques uh, of sex, positi sex positivity, which we should hold um, in mind when we're thinking about how sex positivity works in the cases that I am going to uh, present today. Uh, oh, I've been signed up because I'm currently signed on another device. Oh, damn. Oh, dear. Is that okay? We've got to carry on or should I stop? And then you don't have it. Sorry. It's okay. Should I wait until you're... Let's see if it's still going on. It's just because I'm trying to use it on two different yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying it's to not. be clever. I'm At least now we know. Yeah. Sorry, Anna. It's all right. Don't worry. Take your time. So, so I think the webinar is still going. Yeah, we've still got 15 people on. So I think the webinar is still going on. Yeah, so, yeah. Sorry. Okay. All right. Let's. Okay, cool. Uh, so, yeah, so I was basically saying that these, I think, are legitimate or valid uh, critiques of sex positivity, which we should hold in mind. But they are also, I would say, more uh, critiques of the way in which sex positivity has been applied or has been used, rather than a critique of the approach in itself, as I hope I'm going to be able to demonstrate today. So certainly, when sex and sexual practice is um, emerges in the courtroom, it is, uh, it is um, clear that sex negative attitudes tend to prevail. Um, rape myths, even though there is more aware of them, more awareness of them uh, within um, a, a courtroom context, saturate discourses in criminal cases where sexual violence figures. People will be familiar with the perpetration of these rape myths, how they center around drugs and alcohol, how people are dressed, stigma around mental health or disability, stereotypes around class, ethnicity, sexuality, gender and age. Um, prejudices around particular practices that people might do, whether they've taken photos of themselves in bed with, with each other, texted each other after the alleged sex, um, um, sexual encounter or the rape. And so uh, all of these are used to serve to discredit a claimant as a credible victim of rape and, um, and fold into much more dominant sex negative tropes. So in this realm, um, desire and pleasure uh, are not in themselves considered to be enough to legitimate certain sexual practices, they have negligible value within uh, the politics of understanding justice around sexual encounters. And this is particularly pertinent in the context of understanding how um, so-called sex games gone wrong are presented within the time and space of uh, the courtroom. Uh, so in this presentation, I'm talking about sadomasochism, and I'm also talking about sex games gone wrong, not because I think that they're the same thing, but because I think there is an adjacent overlap that um, is relied upon in order to mobilize certain tropes around um, uh, what practices are legitimate or understandable and which ones are abhorrent and not understandable. And so part of this kind of gliding over of these different categories um, it leads us to a situation where we end up having an encounter within a courtroom where a sex game has allegedly gone wrong and tropes around sadomasochism, which is the which is broadly defined as um, a power exchange or um, uh, a, a, a erotic encounters in which power is played with through a sadomasochistic um, play and or um, uh, bondage and so on and practices. Um, which are associated with uh, that, this, this uh, what we could argue is like a kink subculture, how those are brought to bear on uh, cases which are also presented as a sex game that has gone wrong. So the law is really clear around um, whether or not it's possible to consent to anything which is resulting in anything more than a transient or trifling injury. Many people will be very familiar um, with this, uh, the, the, whether where this is enshrined in the case law. Here you've got the um, the uh, one of the particularly relevant sections of uh, the Brown the Brown judgment. So this is this case um, concerns a group of uh, men who are having sadomasochistic encounters with each other, which they were videotaping, and which uh, were in the, the videotape of which was inter it was intercepted by the police, launching um, a, ve a very high profile. 
um, uh, operation to identify who the perpetrators were, what had happened, the police believing that they had they'd come across some sort of snuff pornography and a uh, lot of um, uh, public money and also lots of energy was spent on, on, on identifying these men and then uh, bringing them to justice. Uh, so this is a comp this is a case which is well known and has been, actually been like widely critiqued in terms of the um, the uh, like the homophobic principles upon which some of the language emerges and you see some of this here. We're talking here about um, uh, um, the uh, the consent defence that was mobilised by men um, in uh, this case that they had consented to what had, what had happened to them and that the people who were, who were the actors the, um, the the dominance if you want uh, had had the, had the consent of the people to whom they were doing this um, these practices but obviously consent is not enough um, so Templeman states that here I'm not prepared to invent a defence of consent for sadomasochistic encounters which breed and glorify cruelty Society is entitled and bound to protect itself against the cult of violence. Pleasure derived from the infliction of pain is an evil thing. Cruelty is uncivilized. So there's little ambiguity there about where Templeman is positioning the, um, the, the practice of sadomasochism, something that is harmful to society itself, an evil thing. So it's, it's, pretty, it's clear that at this point, sex negativity prevails in this judgment. But what I think is we what I think the thing which is interesting to consider is the way in which, despite this being a clear point of law that is also confirmed by the Domestic Abuse Act 2021, the um, uh, the sex game gone wrong, the consent defense in these cases continues to be mobilized. So what you can see on this graph is uh, taken from the campaign group. Um, we can't consent to this. You've done lots of um um, uh, documentary research about cases where a consent claim was mobilized by a defendant in about in order to defend an encounter where he usually um, killed or injured uh, um, his um, female partner usually and so you can see that there is over the past so this is taken from obviously the past several decades and you can see that there is an in, there is a significant increase in the rate and a quantity of cases where a defense, mo a defense, a consent defense is mobilized in these so called sex game gone wrong cases. So, um, even though we know that we can't, that we, we know that we can't consent to harm that is more than transient or trifling, that, uh, and that the pleasure that someone might derive from a sadomasochistic activity is not enough to warrant an exception from that, and we see that from Brown, BDSM is therefore distinguished from other things that people do for pleasure, like um, notably in the judgment, boxing or horseplay. Um, at the same time, because of this proliferation, we can see that something like consent is working or something like consent is believed to be possible to work in these cases. So you, the, over the past 20 years, there is this proliferation of cases, uh, uh, a huge increase in, in uh, the numbers of cases in which um, a, def a defendant mobilizes a, def a, a defense of consent in these cases. And so this, why does this matter? This matters because it, if you want, speaks to something which I'm interested in, which is balancing the needs of, or the, the legal rights of consensual BDSM practitioners who are criminalized in law and the rights of women not to be killed by men using the sex game gone wrong defense as an excuse. And we see this happen, I think, more because we, uh, BDSM subcultural elements have entered the mainstream, but also, it suggests, so going back to this sex positive call from uh, Woder and Panfield, that there is a more tolerant, there is perhaps more tolerance towards might be considered non-normative sexual practices, or is there, is it that something else is going on in and how um, the attitude towards the possibility of this consent emerges? Okay, so what I'm suggesting here is that um, what I'm going to call like a false positivity or a spectacle of positivity in some of these sex game gone wrong cases is emerging. So here I'm thinking about the spectacle using the word of Guy Debord, who writes about the society of the spectacle, how the spectacular divorces, um, has the, has the, it has the effect of divorcing, a, uh, creating a mediated image of an originary thing and divorcing it from its originary meaning. So it is the mediation of social life, through in part commodity fetishism, which obscures the labor that creates the thing that is spectacularized here, sex positivity. 
Um, and um, uh, this uh, relationship then between things and Im images and ideas become taken for granted into a sort of hyper real imagination of sex positivity, which um, obscures what uh, the, the position from which sex positivity might emerge in the first place. So sex positivity is spectacular here because it obscures the work that sex positive, sex positive approaches might bring to understanding these cases. And I think this is what we see emerging in some of the cases that I'm going to talk about today, uh, notably three of these cases, which I'll just go on to in a second. But before I do that, I'm just going to explain what I did in order to think about this from a spectacularized lens. So in order to do this work, I um, was, I, um, I, I was, I, most of this work is taken from the analysis of summing up of judgments in cases where consent defense is, is mobilized. And in order to do that, I um, uh, conducted research on the cases which are a uh, database of cases which might be relevant. And then because of various limitations, which are interesting limitations to think about, but because of various problems associated with doing work on court case transcripts, I was only able to, uh, to analyze in depth cases from 2010 onwards because cases from before 2010, uh, not possible to obtain transcripts of those. Um, and so this is obviously a partial view of the way in which consent is mobilized in these cases. Um, and so uh, not uh, some other cases, the cases, the transcripts were either lost or permission was not given to analyze them. And notwithstanding this, um, I was able to find 25 cases um, which met the criteria in terms of inclusion, in terms of date and jurisdiction, so England and Wales. And um, 13 of these cases are cases of violence, battery, assault or rape. And 12 of these cases are cases where women died and the men were tried for murder or manslaughter. And so uh, even though obviously I don't have the scope to talk about all of those cases now, there are three which I'm gonna show here is kind of like archetypes of how different, how the same defense of consent is mobilized um, and has different legal outcomes. Um, and so these three cases concern women who have been killed as part of a sex game that has gone wrong, so called. So methodologically, what I'm doing when I'm doing this is I'm looking at how language is used in the courts. I'm looking at the discourse in terms of what is said and what is not said, and then looking at the contextual significance of what is said. So where does it appear in the story that the summing up is trying to convey to the jury? And look, doing that by looking for themes, content, and implied meaning. And so this is kind of like a thematic, but also in-depth linguistic analysis of these summing ups of the cases, um, which. Um, I'll show some of you some, some of these to you now. So the first case I want to talk about is that of uh, Dawn Warburton, who uh, in, two, in eight, April 2013 was found hanging from her bedroom um, uh, uh, window, the frame of her window by her neighbour. Um, Mark Pickford was found asleep in the bed, the bed next to her in the same room. And so in this case, he was found uh, not guilty. Um, he'd been accused of um, uh, manslaughter by gross negligence um, and he was found not guilty. And so um, that's, that, that's the outcome of this, of that case. But um, and it, as part of this, one of the salient things in this case was that Mark Warburton and no, Mark Pickford and, and Dawn Warburton were having a sexual relationship which was, which was characterized by uh, the exchange of very explicit text messages about what sorts of sadomasochistic things that they wanted to do to each other. And so his defense, um, apart from, uh, <clears throat> with his defense was that what she had done, she had done to herself, so it's a suicide, and um, that he had nothing to do with it and everything that he was saying about the, um, about the sex, sexual desires that he had for that kind of um, sadomasochistic encounter was just chat, it wasn't real. He was just uh, joining in in this kind of exchange. So in the, <sighs> assisting the jury to come to their decision about this, the judge says, the law does not concern itself with sexual preferences or morality or any emotions connected with all of that. Put morality and views about sexual preferences to one side. None of us is here to sit in judgment about morality and lifestyles. We live in much more sexually liberated times than that. And so what you see emerging here is the judge adopting or espousing a um, what appears to be a tolerant, um, uh, a call that, uh, to understand different sexual, sexual practices and to not adopt a moralistic uh, approach to, um, to, to, to sexual practices which might not be ones uh, which people agree with. 
And so um, it looks like we're, we're starting with, a, it, I think it looks like we're starting with a kernel, the possibility of, of sex positivity, which is tolerant and open to difference um, in, in this statement. So these, I mentioned the text messages in question, and so I'm not going to read these out to you because you can see them here, but this is basically, these are, these are mentioned at length and described at length in the, in the summing up, and indeed are read out um, in the courtroom, and they describe the sorts of practices that both uh, Warburton and Pickford were interested in doing together and so um, they explain quite explicitly their shared interest in this in this in this like in this sadomasochistic element um, you know, which uh, which they both seem excited to to um, to meet each other and to, to to participate in so that's this is given a, this is given over some of the uh, evidence that they are going to uh, uh, some of the evidence of the of the nature of their relationship so based on those um, uh, um, text messages, the judge then continues, having read these messages out, saying, does it give an indication, if you needed any further indication, of what she liked? But from his viewpoint, does it give an indication of what he liked, or was it, as he asserts to you, drunken sex chat via text? So we're starting to open up the possibility that something may be that... that um, Warburton's interest in sadomasochism might be something that, um, is something that only, only she held, but Pickford himself was just engaging in some drunken sex chat. Um, linguistically, the claim, if you, if you needed any, invest, any further indication, suggests that it's so abundant, her interest in sadomasochism, that all of these text messages are just overkill. It's the, the clarity of her interest in that sexual practice is uh, um, uh, unquestionable. And the judge continues, she had an interest in sadomasochistic sex. He has told you he did not. She plainly acted as at least a part-time prostitute. He had no problem with that conduct. And finally, um, and later on in the um, uh, judge, in the summing up, we're told, DNA swabs of the anus and vulva revealed that there was material from the deceased, obviously the defendant and another person. It is impossible to say who that other person was. So even if we're holding on the one hand, the possibility that the judge offers of being sex positive in terms of understanding difference and not judging somebody for their sexual um, desires, uh, their sadomasochistic interests, what uh, the judge then goes on to do is frame um, Warburton as a, um, as a person who is other or uh, beyond the pale, so to speak, through her indication, if you needed any further indication uh, uh, of her desire for sadomasochistic sex, that she has acted as a sex worker, um, that, and that that is it demonstrated her promiscuity is demonstrated by the fact that um, uh, after her her death, um, DNA of a third unknown person is found in her body, which demonstrates that she had had an, an intimate encounter with someone who was not simply Pickford, who with whom she was in bed. So stigmatizing tropes around sex work and around interest in sadomasochism and around promiscuity come back into play in the way in which this uh this uh the elements of this case are summed up to the to the jury in order to um in in order to if you want act, to act as a corrective to the narrative that there is a um uh um that there is all this there should be a toleration of the um, non-normative sexual practices that Warburton and indeed Pickford claim to have been interested in. The, uh, the next case I wanted to talk about is that of Charlotte Teeling. So Teeling um, uh, uh, was killed in February 2018 by a man that she had just met. Um, she had been out on a night out. At the end of the night, early hours of the morning, she um, encountered him in the street and they went back to his apartment where they drank alcohol and took drugs and had rough sex. And he said that it was at her behest that he choked her and slapped her and she died. But that was an accident because he was surprised by someone knocking on his bedroom door and he was distracted and he didn't mean to kill her. Um, but that, what he had been doing with her had been at her request and had been in a kept like So she had been she had been consenting to the to the rough sex. So here again, the judge um, uh, provides these instructions to the to the jury. This is not a court of morals. I strongly suspect that in these days, it no longer needs to be said. Many years ago, people would have taken a view one way or another about two people meeting up and going and having intercourse within such a very short space of time. People would take a view about people looking at pornography and all that sort of thing. I doubt very much if a modern jury would be remotely moralistic about any of that, but in case you were tempted to be, please don't be. So once again, 
thematically echoing the stuff that we've seen with uh, Warburton, uh, positioning the possibility that the, the jury should approach this evidence with tolerance and um, without, without being moralistic. Um, but before he says any of that, this is where he, how he opens his uh, summing up. Uh, we need to think about a fact that came late in the day, but is an agreed fact about her activities as a webcam girl. Now, why do you know? Why do you need to know about that? It helps you perhaps from two points of view. One is the question of anal intercourse. You remember that what Mr. Bailey said to the police was that it wasn't actually his wish or her instigation that anal intercourse took place. He said it was a mistake and that he was surprised by how easy the intercourse was. And from that point of view, it may plainly be of relevance to know that she had acted as a webcam girl, filming herself inserting a sex toy into her anus on several um, occasions. So actually we ask ourselves, it's a good question that he asked, why do we need to know that? Because we don't, we, what we do know is that she did not die from any, 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 any anal sex that um, took place and that there is no question of whether or not she consented to, the, there is no rape allegation in this, in this case. It's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a murder charge that, he's, that Bailey is facing. But the narrative of, but the fact of, of um, revealing this case, which apparently is of significant importance, that not only um, is was um, a teeling a sex worker, but also that part of that sex work was around practices which remain somewhat taboo around uh, anal intercourse. Um, has the practice has the effect of calling into question really the uh, the extent of the tolerance or the or the um, uh, the uh, the openness to difference that might be that that the initial the the initial instructions seem to espouse. And so here you've got a bit more of how um, the this so again this is coming out at length from the um, from the summing up this is from the transcript of the police interview that um, Bailey um, um, uh, was involved in, and so it describes some of the, uh, the 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 different ways in which her consent is construed through these encounters. So things which are relevant here, Charlotte seems to be the driving force. She's been asking you to do these things. Have you done anything like that before with another female? Vaguely, but I was a bit scared. I met this girl and I was a bit scared, a bit worried to what she was asking me to do. And actually asked her, why do you not have a boyfriend? Because you're every man's dream. And she said, because they run a mile, basically. Um, so the police is asking him, have you had experiences before with other females asking you to do those things? He says, worse, this one, one female was asking me to do. I was just too scared to do anything like that. Okay, so you've never choked a female in sexual intercourse before. No, I don't remember. I don't remember vaguely. I remember what happened with this chick in Leicester, but, it was, but I was scared. Have you ever been rough in terms of when you've been having sex with a female? Yeah, I have a bit, a bit, but they've initiated it all. Believe me. And um, if you hear what... Well, you have, I mean, this, 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 the significance of the way in which um, Bailey prevaricates around his fear, around what he's being asked to do by all these different women, including women who could be every man's dream because they are so interested in violent or sadomasochistic encounters, even as they are, according to his words, which he puts, her words, which he puts in his mouth, uh, that she, that makes men run a mile, basically. And so, um, in this encounter, as in all of his encounters, Bailey is the passive um, assistant, if you want, to the uh, to the, the the more extreme, scary desires that uh, the women who, with whom he has had rough sex um, appear to express. And so, the final case that I want to talk about is that of Laura Hudson. And so, this is a tiny. This is a case which is a bit different in its structure because, in this case, um, Jason Gaskill. Um, has, has pleaded guilty to um, uh, the gross negligence manslaughter of Hudson. Um, again, this is another case where the couple met a few, only a few hours before, um, before, she, before, uh, they, they, um, before she died. Uh, he stabbed her in the neck with a knife that he kept in his room for the purpose of, of, like, of knife play, which is a specific form of sadomasochistic um, uh, um, practice uh, where you simulate um, or sometimes do cut the skin, but simulate threatening with with a knife in order to um, create uh, a, an, an, an environment of um, erotic fear, or so on. And so, um, as he, so in this case, uh, Gaskell pleaded guilty. And so, what's going on here? This is these are going to be the sentencing remarks of the discussion between the um, prosecution and the judge deciding 
what to do about sentencing um, Gaskell for um, the death of uh, Laura Hudson. Um, so the judge says, basically, uh, he says, because it simply indulging in sadomasochistic sex doesn't necessarily involve a criminal act. Uh, but here what you've got is the knife involved. It's grossly dangerous. And the prosecution says, yes, it may be one of those hybrid type cases. Holding a knife to somebody's throat is unlawful, as a lawful act potentially, where she consents to that. Judge says, well, I think you can consent to that because you're not actually physically being hurt. No, it's a simulated threat. This isn't a real threat. I'll talk about that one in a second. But so, yeah, we started off with the um, uh, with the opening uh, the, the judge and the prosecution opening up to the possibility. So masochism is a thing that people do. Yeah, it's just a simulated threat. It's not something it's not the same thing as threatening somebody with a weapon where you actually intend to hurt them. So um, it's open, so it holds space for the possibility of that sexual practice to be a legitimate one for Gaskell to do. Um, the case goes on. So in this case, um, the judge is very keen to establish that Gaskell's like a uh, knowledgeable sadomasochistic practitioner. And he talks a lot about the use or not of safe words, which are words which are used to bring any action to an end. And in order to do this, he talks about, um, he uses the evidence uh, of, the, of, the, of a woman who lived with Gaskell in their shared house. So, so Hudson had met Gaskell, they'd gone back to his shared house, which he lived in with another couple of young people and they had all been talking about what had gone on. And, and uh, Hudson is saying to this speaker, she's expressing a concern about a sexual encounter that, she's ha that has happened with her and Jason Gaskell. So the, 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 the housemate says, I asked her what was wrong and she told me that during intercourse with Jason, he had strangled her and she safe worded on him because she couldn't breathe and he didn't stop. He didn't think he was going to stop, but eventually he did. I just, I don't think, like, I know Jason's a bit rough in the bedroom. I thought it was that. I didn't think he meant to do it. And elsewhere in the accounts of the judge speaking again, she speaks of him not being prone to use extreme violence, but engaging in rough sex. And the judge then says, yes, but he did use what is called a safe word. So that other participant in the consensual state of masochistic activity could say, say what, say stop, or whatever the word is. And he eventually did stop. And that's what she was reporting to the other occupant of the house. Yes, that's the word my Lord's just used eventually this is a significant one. She's reporting that he didn't stop at once, but he eventually stopped. So the use, Gaskell's use of safe words is mentioned four times in the judgment as evidence of his good sadomasochistic practice. Now, people within the BDSM community or who do who are BDSM um, scholars will, will know that um, say how safe words are used and responded to is subjective within um, that, that subculture. And of course, um, uh, there's no, there are no hard and fast rules really about how safe words might be responded to. But what is salient here is not, I think for me, that he did eventually stop. What is salient is that it's reported to the flatmate as a concern that he wasn't stopping. And so um, the uh, spectre here of sex positivity, of how he was a good SM practitioner, is used here to silence Hudson in her concern that she's expressing to somebody who she also just met that he didn't stop and she was frightened. So to kind of wrap up my thinking around this, I think that what we see in the, each of these cases is a seemingly tolerant attitude to sexual practice, which is used to account for how women end up in this, this situation in the first place. And there are assumptions of consent. So consent is assumed to have happened. There's no evidence of how we know that there was consent in, in most of these cases. So the sex positive tropes of agency or freedom to choose are mobilized by, by allowing space for women to decide to participate in sadomasochism or bondage and sadomasochism. And that which also folds into responsabilization discourses for those women. So even though the space is held for these to be legitimate and possible sexual desires, they are also used to further distance, these, distance women as uh, deviant figures who have these, um, these desires. So I think it's clear that there is, a, there is a shift occurring in how some courts are prepared to understand sadomasochism beyond Brown and sex, sex positivity or a vision of that, a version of that is deployed to ignore the structural power imbalances that compose how, how current problems with sex games gone wrong are figured. You have the imagination of the sexually uh, um, em emancipated woman who is free to choose these sex acts, but that freedom comes at a price. And so in some of these interactions, the spectacularized sex positivity might appear to echo rather than undermine 
uh, rape myths which cast women who might be sex workers or interested in sadomasochism or promiscuous or living complex lives as legitimate victims of violence and death occurring as part of these so-called sex games gone wrong which assume consent where there is none. So ultimately there remains I think a more consistent and committed engagement with sex positive principles in these cases in, in, in cases which deal with consensual sadomasochism or sex games gone wrong to achieve justice for women whether they have practiced BDSM or have been falsely figured as doing so.